Today I'm going to talk about practical usage of meta classes and decorators. A lot of programmers look at meta classes as a kind of black magic of Python. Understanding them is very difficult. You can't really read the code because you don't know what the code is doing based on what the code says. Um, people try to stay far away from them. However, if you understand how it works, it can provide you a lot of power, a lot of capabilities that the standard tool set doesn't give you. So as soon as you understand it and you start working with them, if they don't drive you insane, then you'll be able to take advantage of the power that it gives you. I'm Sim Zax, that's Sim like the card in your cell phone. I'm a principal and engineer at Red Hat, one of the diamond sponsors of the conference. We're going to talk about meta classes, decorators, and then we're going to go into a practical example that will show you exactly how it's done and uh, what is a good use case for it. So far, the presentations have been PowerPoints and pictures and stuff. I know that coders like code. We're going to go through a lot of code. So one of the great things about Python is that you have full access to the behind-the-scenes method that Python itself uses to operate. Most of the time, these things happen in the background, and you don't really need to know about them. But every once in a while, a requirement will pop up. They're the standard tool set couldn't or shouldn't be used for this, and that's when you can start playing with the black magic and really get taking advantage of what it has to offer. So we're all familiar with the standard object-oriented programming class definition. You have the class keyword followed by the name of the class. You put the uh, uh, classes that it inherits from in parentheses. And then you have the attributes, which are either the um, uh, methods or the variables uh, that, are, that are needed for it. Now, if you look after you instantiate the class at what the type of the uh, instance is, you'll see that the type is of type my class, right? the name of the class. And what that's basically telling us is that when you created a new class, you are creating a new type. It's basically a user-defined type. And if you look at the type of my class, the class itself, you'll see that the type of that is type because it is its own type. And this is true as we go through the entire language. The type of a number is of type int, but if you look at the type of the type of int, which is basically the type of int itself, that's a type. The same is true for list and all of the other objects in uh, uh, user-defined types. Uh, what gets interesting is that the type of type is also type. We see from here that that type is its own class, it's its own object. We remember from the class that we defined, we had two methods. We had the init method, and the init method is always called uh, right after the instantiation of a class, and the add method. And over here, I've defined them outside of the class structure. We have self-parameter, the argument, which this looks a bit strange if it's not inside a class. But what you have to realize is that self is only a common coding convention. The name could be anything. You could call it this, or me, or hello, or pizza, depending on what you wanted to call it. Uh, so when Python sees the word self, it doesn't think of it as anything different or anything weird. It's just a regular parameter. The way that Python works with uh, uh, object-oriented is that when you call the method of a class, is that it passes that instance into the class as the first parameter, which is what comes into the self uh, argument generally. So now we mentioned before that type was its own form of class, and what we used type for is to create classes. And this is what uh, we, we're seeing over here, that we have the new class variable, which uh, we instantiate the type class with the name of the class, then we pass in the base classes, which in this case, uh, there are none. Object is the default. This uh, uh, method only creates new form of classes. Um, and then there's the attribute dictionary, which here we have the name init, which 
uh, references the function pointer, the function reference in it, and the name add, which references the function reference of add. And so therefore, it's going to create them, even though they're not inside of a class section. And then if you go and instantiate this class, uh, you have the same function as if you created it, uh, the nice, uh, user-friendly, structured way. Why would I want to do this? So first of all, this is how Python creates the class in the back end, is that after you build your beautifully structured class, it goes in there and it reads it, it parses it through, it grabs the name, puts it into here, grabs the bases, sticks it into here, and then it builds an attribute class, an attribute dictionary, and sticks that into there as well, calls type, and creates your class. So you might be wondering, who cares? Everybody would want to use the easy-to-read, user-friendly version instead of this um, monstrosity. And there is two reasons. One reason is because you can do dynamic class creation, which is a lot of fun. Uh, the second reason is because, and that's more relevant to what we're talking about here, is that if you understand how Python creates the class, then you can manipulate it to create classes and do things with your classes that can't be done with the standard tool set. So for example, we're going to create a new type, which inherits from type. Type, as we mentioned, is a class. And here we're going to use the new function. Uh, the new function is always called on creation of a new class. Uh, it, first it calls new, then it calls um, init. Uh, other functions that you could use if you were playing with, uh, with these is uh, call, but we're not going to talk about that. And here we're just going to add, before creation, we're going to print the name of the uh, class was created, and then we are going to return uh, the super, which basically says go and call the types uh, new function so that it actually finishes creating the class. So what happens when we do this is now we create our class with new type instead of type, and we pass in the name of the class. And by the way, the, the names don't have to be the same as the variable name. So we could call this uh, new class 2 equals new type and put foo in there. But then if we looked for new class 2.name, it would come up with foo, and that would confuse us. Right? And then we pass in the bases and the uh, uh, functions as we did before. And now if we uh, try to instantiate that class, as soon as we create the class, now it comes up with our print statement right there, new class 2 was created. And then, as you can see, it has normal functionality for the class as if it was created in any other way. Can we do the same sort of thing with the uh, beautifully structured standard class definitions? And the answer is, of course we can. We just add the underscore underscore meta class underscore underscore keyword tell it which type it is that we want to create the function with, or create the class with. And what it then does is, as it's parsing through, it will say, oh, you don't want to use type to create your class. You want to use new type to create your class. And it will go and it will do that for you. So that's pretty much what we need to know about uh, meta classes before we get into our example. Decorators are basically a framework uh, that allows you to change the environment under which a uh, function is run. So here's an example of a decorator uh, from Django uh, that it's basically require get in. A decorator is basically a function. You import it from another module or you create it in your own module. Here we put uh, at require get on top of the function. What this will do is we'll say only get requests will go through it, but everything else will fail, like posts. This is from the, the web world. And how does that work? So there's a function called requireGet, which takes the re function reference as a uh, parameter. And I'll talk about wraps in just a second. Then you have an inner function, because you can have functions within functions. And that takes all of the arguments that the uh, function that you were trying to call should take. Uh, often you'll just use star args and star star quarks so that you can have the same decorator for multiple functions irrespective of what their parameters are. And then if you look over here, it just checks if the request method is not get, then it raises an exception. 
If it doesn't raise that exception, then it's going to return the func. Func is the function that you really wanted to call, passing in the same parameter list. And then the whole function returns uh, the inner function. Now, what is wraps? Wraps is a parameter. Now, basically what we've done is we've changed the function reference. And when you do that, weird things happen. So if we, let's say we don't use wraps before I tell you what it does do. Let's say we defined our, our uh, decorator as my deck, right? And we had our inner and it returns the func. And then we decorated uh, function A that has parameters A, B, and C with my deck. And now we look at a uh, dot underscore underscore name, underscore underscore. I think I'll just use name. Uh, and it will tell you inner. But if you look at the function reference now of what the word a, the name a, is pointing to, the word name a is now pointing to uh, the inner function, which is what gets called. And so therefore, it thinks that's what its name is. Now, if you use wraps, wraps moves the name and the doc string and a number of the other basic attributes over to the uh, top function. And so therefore, when you look for them, and over here we have the example where if you use at wraps using the same code, then if you look for a.name, it tells us a, which is exactly what we would expect it to do. Now there's another gotcha with descriptors, or with uh, decorators, that uh, I came into uh, recently. We found a big bug in our code, and this was relevant to the uh, code that I was, uh, we're going to deal with in the example, uh, is that we had a function f, uh, which has uh, parameters a, b, and c, and uh, two local variables, d and e. Now, if you want to know what the local variables of a function are, you would look at f.funcode.covarnames. Right? If you want to know how many there are, you could look at code.arg count. And so let's say you want to know uh, all of your arguments. You want to know a, b, and c. You would do f.funcode.covarnames, right? uh, spliced to get only up to number three, and it will give you the list. However, when we called this after decorating uh, the function, right? We call it decorated at uh, my deck on top of A, which was getting A, B, and C. Then we asked, is B one of those uh, uh, variables, one of those parameters? And it told us no. And this actually came up uh, in a real situation where code stopped working a week after we threw in some code and we couldn't figure out what was going on because it was giving a really weird error. Um, and if we look at the covar names, uh, it tells us args and quarks, which is the var names, which are the parameters of the inner function and not the parameters of, uh, of A. So there's another module that helps deal with this problem. It's called decorator, and uh, it has to be version 4.0.9 or higher. Uh, generally, decorator, uh, at least on uh, my instance, was installed by default, but it wasn't that version, so it gave an error that decorate didn't exist. And the way that this works is you define your inner function out of the uh, decorator function. And then inside the decorator function, you call the decorator function passing in the function reference and the reference to the inner function. And then that will take care of that problem. And after doing that, uh, if we ask if B is in the uh, uh, func code covar names, uh, it comes up with true. And it also handles the, uh, the name property and the doc string and all of that. Uh, in any case, most of the time, using the at wraps is a great way of doing it. It covers 90% of the cases. Um, but every once in a while, you'll get a gotcha like this, um, and you'll have to know how to deal with it. Now that we understand how uh, meta classes work and how decorators work, we can jump in and start having fun. So I got a requirement recently. Sounds like a very standard requirement. It was send all usage and exception data to our logstash server. Now, the environment is I've got a library uh, with more than 50 classes and more than 10,000 lines of code. All of those classes are descendants of a single base class. 
In order to send something to Logstash, first of all, that's a very simple piece of code. You just have to uh, you know, get the Logstash module, uh, set up your parameters, what level of logging you want, and then you, you just call the using the standard logging function of Python underscore logger, uh, and that all works automatically. So that's not, that's not a challenge. My first thought was that I'll define a send usage data function inside the base class, and then in every function, I'll just add a send usage data. Now, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of code. And I'm going to have to also throw in try and accepts under every function so that I can send exception data as well. Uh, that's a very poor way of doing it. Um, generally, people like uh, throwing print statements and things like that into their code. And it makes your code very messy and very hard to maintain that. And here, if we made a decorator called send usage data, then in the inner function, we first have send data, which tells us usage data, somebody called this function. And then before we call the actual function, we put that into a try and accept, where if there's a problem, we're going to send the error data. And then we're going to raise the error back up to the user. So the user gets the exception that he should be getting. And the error data is and the usage data are both sent up to the server. So this looks like a great solution. The way that I would do this then is go to every uh, function and put a decorator on top of it. The two problems with this is, first of all, any time that I have to write a lot of the same code, such as adding this at uh, send usage data on top of every function that I have, there's got to be a better way of doing it. And the second issue is there's a concept in business called focus on your core business. And what that means is only do the things that you're really good at and outsource everything else. And I was thinking, if this is a good concept in business, it should also work in programming. Meta classes to the rescue. So here we're going to define a logging meta of type type. You know, with, uh, it inherits from type. And it's going to override the, uh, the new function. And the new function gets the same uh, parameters as the init function, which are what you use to initialize the class. So it's got the name of the function, the bases, and the adders dictionary. What's relevant to us is the adders dictionary. So what's in the adders dictionary is, first of all, we have the item and the adder value. The item is the name. That's the string value that represents the uh, name. And then the adder val is the uh, function reference. So I'm looking for three things here. First of all, I'm looking for if the value is a function type. If the value is a function type, right, if the adder val, uh, then what I want to do is instead of having the name pointing to the actual function, I want the name to point to the log wrapper function, which takes the initial adder value, which was the function reference that I really want to call, and then I stick that into there. So basically what I'm saying is that when you call add, call log wrapper passing in add. The next thing I'm looking for is if I have a class method, because class methods uh, work differently than regular methods. And a class method has to be the top level function in a function call. So if you have any sort of um, uh, wrapper, uh, you can't put that wrapper on top of the class method wrapper because that will stop, uh, make it stop working as a class method and make it work as a regular method. So, and this is also true if you happen to have any um, functions that are wrapped that you want to change the order in. So what we do over here is we have to get, uh, and using the, the underscore underscore get uh, method, that's uh, using the descriptors. Uh, because basically you can change how you get things. And over here we want to get the method that's wrapped by class method in order to stick it into the log wrapper so that we can put class method on top of that. The third thing I'm looking for is if I have an attribute that starts with the word underscore log stash. And this was just a convention that I used so that in my class I could pass in um, certain parameters that I wanted, such as the URL, the port, different things that I want from the, from the uh, class that's going to be calling this. And then I'm going to basically stick those into a, uh, uh, into a dictionary. And finally, uh, in this new function that we're calling, 
Um, we're going to init the logger, which is that initial code I showed you, which is how to uh, uh, get your log stash to work. And then we're going to call super again so that the type uh, object finishes creating the class. So how does the my logger function work? So the my logger takes the original function plus any arguments or keywords that are uh, given it. Um, and then we first call the, um, uh, the info function in order to uh, log the usage data and uh, do the try and accept around the function uh, call itself. Uh, and therefore, we have the same functionality that we had in that decorator that we saw before. This is basically the decorator. Uh, and then we use on the bottom here that same method that I showed you uh, uh, using the decorate function instead of using at wraps because of that problem with the func codes. After all of this, we've built our meta class. How do we integrate this into our library? Well, this is a minimally invasive method of doing this. All you have to do after you have the meta class is uh, go into your base class, change the meta class over here by setting it to logging meta, and then setting any of the underscore log stash attributes that you want. And suddenly, every single function and class method in your uh, 50 class library has logging attached to it. Now, if you read your, uh, your code, you won't see any decorators, and you won't see any um, uh, mention that it is being logged. So this can be confusing if somebody goes and sees an error or starts to play with something or tries to understand what it is you're doing and why it's sending those logs, um, but that's their problem. Uh, so the logstasher.py, that entire uh, meta class, which can be plugged into any function, any library that you have, or any class, uh, can be found over here on, uh, on, on GitHub. Uh, you can just take that, put uh, underscore underscore meta class equals uh, logging meta into your code uh, after um, uh, installing the, the logstasher.py, and that will work for you, and then you have the code. Uh, the question was, is the uh, syntax of uh, meta classes different in Python 2 and Python 3? The answer is not really, but there's a lot more you can do with Python 3, so there's additional syntax. But the same code should work uh, both in Python 2 and Python 3. Might be one or two minor changes. Okay, why do we need to uh, use the decorate method? Why didn't somebody fix wraps? I don't know why they didn't fix wraps. Um, but thankfully, there's another library that, that handles the same sort of thing. Uh, so that's what we're using. Um, but that's a very good question for the, uh, for the Funk Tools people. Is there any uh, existing meta library that you can use with existing code? Is there, is there such a thing as meta for modules? There are other functions for modules. Um, I can't think of what it is off the top of my head, but uh, there's something that happens when you import. There's an import function, which, which happens as you import a module, uh, or on module uh, stand up, which then lets you start playing with the module as it comes in. So there is similar functionality. Um, I haven't used it for a number of years, so I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh, it's something I played with a number of years ago. And that's what we've got for today. Thank you very much.